how do I justify continuing to be like competitive and I mean that it's not like I want I mean right now I feel like I'm banned and it's like I get it now like I shouldn't say anything right because people don't want to don't want to hear anything I have to say I don't blame them because mm -hmm. it's just a mess right now obviously I was I mean I was I was concerned I was you know, to be totally honest, disappointed that his his name was, was in there. Um, but, you know, I kind of, being a cycling geek like I am, I, I, I mean, I, I knew sort of the culture that existed in pro cycling. Yeah, I remember I picked up the phone, he's like, uh, it was kind of, he was kind of quiet. Like, he's like, um, uh, I gotta, I gotta tell you something. All the, all the notions were out there. I mean, it, there was, so many allegations over so many years for so many people in so many different directions knowing to what uh, the older champions uh, admitted to using later in their career it it wasn't too much of a surprise and he said you know this whole Lance thing that is in the media right now um, well there were a bunch of riders that were involved in that I mean as soon as he said that I, I I, I got it like I knew what was going on. And it, it has a lot to do with the Fondo and Sonoma County and everybody around here who's, they've all been cool. I mean, I haven't heard anything negative from anyone I know, but I still feel like I owe it to, like everybody who's ever participated or volunteered or worked on the Fondo, you know, to like, I just, it doesn't seem right to just end everything. Am I, am I banned from from doing, Assistant. raising money and, and helping put on like the best day on, the, on a bike in the whole year. Mm. I think they're, they're separate and it's, it's not black and white. Levi was different than the other guys who were named. Um, a lot of the other guys who were named were on a team that allowed them to stay employed and remain in cycling or they retired. Levi was in neither situation and he got sacked. That kept his name in the news. Um, so he, I feel like he had to wear this scandal a bit more than some of the other people who did the same thing. As you can imagine, especially right after uh, the recent decision in, in October, I had media requests from everyone. Every single TV station and newspaper and, and uh, website there is. You know, when all these statements came out in these international publications like the Wall Street Journal discussing this in the USA Today, um, he sat down the next day with our local sports guy in the Press Democrat and gave them the interview he wouldn't give to anybody else because this is his community and everyone else can report on that Press Democrat interview and you can help understand it that way. So there was very much an obligation to folks, and, and the TEDx talk was, was part of that. Greg got an email back in January, around January, about the opportunity to do the TEDx talk here in Sonoma County and saw it as a, as a challenge, an opportunity to do something completely different. He was pretty apprehensive about doing it in the first place. He felt like it just, everything had been talked about enough. You know, he was worried about getting the spotlight again. He wasn't trying to make excuses and he was worried that this was just a, you know, was gonna be seen as like a publicity stunt. Sure, he wanted to be able to tell his story, but he was, you know, he wasn't sure if that was the way to do it. Um, I think understandably so. I mean, you don't know and there's no formula for this Please welcome to the Texas Sonoma County stage, Levi Liebheimer. Mm -hmm. It's like they say Liebheimer, your audio is hot. Before okay. that, it's not hot. They so, know how to pronounce my name. It's actually Leipheimer. Leipheimer. Yeah. They will. I'm sorry about That's that. That's all right. I just yeah. want to make sure. I should know how. You know, That's okay. I've been watching the tour forever, so. Okay. The anyway. rehearsal the day before wasn't anything like actually giving the talk. <laughs> the, giving the talk was, uh, like I said, I just I felt like I was looking at myself just being an idiot on stage. Looking back, reading something like the Grand Fondo seems like an act of extension. He really wanted to distill this idea of, you know, this, this idea of what it means to have a dream versus what it means to have success. And how one is 
very sweet, very quaint, um, literally childlike. Success is different. It's checkered, it's, um, it's by necessity, it's bruised, beaten, and battered. You still get to own it, um, but it's, it, it's, it's different, and a lot of times people conflate the two. You know, to prepare a speech and then get up there and, and recite that by memory, 15 minutes in front of a crowd, and you know, obviously it's being recorded, it's very difficult. I hope it saves the sport, what you've done, so. Appreciate it. It means a lot to everybody. He just wasn't sure if, if this was right, what he was doing, but you can't be sure. I mean, you're, you're, you have to, he was stepping way outside of his comfort zone. And it was good for him because I saw a lot of things change after that. Oh, Lifetimer. Lifetimer, hi. Yeah, two eyes, Lifetimer. Thank you. I just want to make sure of your question, With amazing. the way that he saw this experience and how he can use it for good, rather than just shoving it under the rug or like, you know, hiding from it. Um, he can use it to, to do a lot of good for people. Please welcome to the TEDx Sonoma County stage, Levi Leipheimer. When he came out and did that grand horse ride, we did a couple weeks ago. And Pave Magazine did a little piece, shows a picture of him riding. Okay. Well, next thing you know, I start getting some emails from journalists hey. asking questions. Oh, yeah. So Levi's out on your group rides. So are you guys working together? What's the deal? What's your policy on working with dopers? Blah, 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 blah. blah. And it's just like, wow. Okay. You know, we need to be ahead of this. I don't need to be reacting to that kind of stuff. I need to be making statements that we're working with A, B, or C, and here's why. And we're behind it 100% for these reasons. And if I can make those kinds of statements, then I go, oh, right, I get it. I think that Vanessa and Austin definitely, like, they have a really tough job because they're responsible for these kids when they're operating these camps or, you know, operating races. I mean, their kids are under their wing and they're trying to do everything they can to make sure that these kids are getting the best possible experience and being exposed to the best parts of what cycling is all about. You know, um, having you involved is awesome in my opinion. Awesome. And I want to, to build yeah. that more yeah. as long as that's something that you're so, interested oh, in doing. So that's what we want to talk a little bit about. But take a step back from that. We're around this table. We can be friends. I know you. I feel comfortable with that. But let's go a couple steps away from that. People that yeah. don't know you, yeah. parents of 14, 15 year olds that are in our program that don't know you as a person, they just know you from what they read in the media. When I think back to when I was 13, there was there was no, you know, NorCal League, there was no NICA. Yeah. But, you know, I became a professional cyclist regardless, even though I grew up in a place where cycling was was like non-existent yeah. you know the weather didn't cooperate the community yeah. didn't cooperate and it's foreign and literally. yeah so when i got to the highest level and you know I sort of experienced what that was like and i made those choices you know that was i kind of came into it unprepared right and and i think that we are I mean, as it's been said we're if we don't learn from history we're doomed to repeat it so therefore i think that you know just telling the story and, and letting these kids know what I went through, I think helps a lot. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. Mm -hmm. And not trying to sweep things under the rug. Well, I'm very appreciative that they have uh, allowed me to, to go talk to the kids. Uh, I think that they see the benefit in it. Here's a real life person who lived it and walked that path and can uh, explain the story to these kids and, and, and I think bring it right to their attention so that they're forced to think about it and um so when the time comes if the time comes where they have to make a decision similar to that I and mean, it could be in in any it could be outside of sport for example that they've given it some thought already and they're not blindsided i think it's it's giving them some tools to go forward you know there was sort of a lot of anxiousness 
going into the camp, you know, getting out there and just not knowing really exactly what to expect. We'd neither, me or Levi, had ever been to one of these things before. Kid in a candy store. Yeah. This is like the most incredible place I've ever ridden. And, and the ride that you're gonna do today is gonna be about a 25 mile, 5,000 feet of climbing, and it's just sick, single track. There's no fire road. We showed up and it was like, we immediately jumped on our bike and we started riding. And we did what everybody there was passionate about, which was super cool, you know? We all jumped on our bikes, we went and rode. The kids were stoked. They're riding with somebody who stood on the podium of the Tour de France, won the Tour of California three times. It, um, it's somebody that a lot of these kids have looked up to for some time now. And they're showing him trails that they've been riding for a few days, so they're pumped. The camps are my favorite part of my whole job um, because it's such a real learning experience as a former as a former educator it really is meaningful to me so because the kids get that really really well-rounded experience so they get um, the physical conditioning and they get some counseling they get some information about diet nutrition about gear and how to work on their bikes and we really try and involve all of those pieces because we have a whole span of kids for me we have beginners to kids who really know quite a lot about cycling. You have to provide content that is differentiated, and so that's what we really try and do at our camps. They watched the documentary, The Levi Effect, before a Q&A with him, and you know, a lot of times we talk about, we were talking about things that, um, you know, ideas he had for things that he wanted to talk to the kids about, but I never expected um, it to, be as powerful as it as it was. I kind of messed in the movie, but how long for Levi? How long have you been off of drugs and racing? So the last time that I did anything, which was not not necessarily drugs, but I transfused my own blood, was for the 2007 Tour de France. That's when I got on the podium. What an opportunity for these kids to learn from his mistakes. It's so easy for everyone to say, "I would have done it differently." I would have come back and be just been an electrician or, you know, written some really shitty novels or done whatever stupid thing Levi was supposed to do when he was supposed to just say no. Everybody was all lined up to do that. These kids got to experience that firsthand. They got to see really what they would do. They got to see what happened when someone else's integrity got tested and they get to learn from that. And to have a discussion with somebody in an environment like that, that um, that's just so candid, I think does far more for them and their development in this sport than if you just put somebody up there who had never ever had any of his mistakes plastered all over the evening news. When I was 13, I mean, it wasn't like, oh, I want to ride the Tour de France and, oh yeah, I'll do these drugs, like, right? <laughs> you don't dream about that when you're a kid. And somewhere along the line, little by little, I got to that point, and that's not something I'm proud of. It's pretty, it's, it's not fun to live with that right now, I'll tell you that much, and you don't want to have to go through that. It couldn't have been a comfortable situation for Levi to put himself in. So that's why I respect him so much for doing that, because he's opening himself up uh, to any sort of question. Um, and that couldn't have been easy for him. What's, what's next for Levi? I've got all this knowledge and, and experience from, from three decades of, of committing myself and dedicating myself to the sport. And I'd love to give it to the next generation. And, and like a parent to their kids, you know, parents made mistakes when they were kids and they don't want to see their kids make mistakes. So they're always kind of like, you know, don't do this, or don't do that. And there's a reason because, you know, I don't want you guys to make the mistakes that I made. And, um, Whatever I can do to give back, that's, that's what's next for me. As we were leaving, Carlos and I were leaving the camp, uh, the, the kids came up to me and they, they gave me this card and they had drew, drew a picture on it and you know, we said, it said, thank you Levi, we love you and everybody signed it and wrote a, a little note and that was, uh, that was pretty awesome. I mean, that, that just made my year. It was a great opportunity to really look at who our people are. You know, are our people here because they love the sport of professional cycling and the Grand Fondo is something that gives them that experience? 
so that they get to taste the world of professional cycling? Um, or is it something else? I'd always kind of thought it was something else. And we, yeah, we were super nervous. In some way we knew that the rate of registration was gonna be a moratorium on the public opinion of what had just happened to rock American cycling. What we saw just in that short period of time was not that so goes the sport of professional cycling, therefore so goes the Grand Fondo. What we saw was people who love to ride their bikes and they want to do it in the best place under the auspices of the best event possible. And that was a good feeling. It became so much bigger than just a ride with Levi because people left with speechless. They didn't know what to say. You know, the idea that he had was, yeah, come ride with me, but I'm gonna show you something special. I'm gonna show you something that very few people have seen before. Something that, that made me fall in love with this place. I would almost say people would come if Levi was there or not. Now, um, no offense to him. <laughs> this spring, I had the idea that, well, we have this, this cycling fund that the Grand Fondo has, has given towards us. Yeah. It's the Bellow Street Cycling Fund. You're the first one to ride the new Cave Dale. I'm not joking. We're in a position to be able to do something to help because we have a budget set aside for community specific projects and this is one that we decided made sense to us. You know, why not make cycling better? Not just for the cyclists, but for people on, you know, driving their cars too. These roads are screwed up, no one's taking care of them. We might as well step up and help out. You know, four days before the event is great because you're out of time. Like, so the world is making choices for you. That ridiculous thing you wanted to do with the, uh, with, with the sky crane, probably not gonna happen. You know, the, uh, the billboards you wanted to buy to welcome people at the Sonoma County border, probably not gonna have time for that one. Um, that's actually my favorite part of the event because it's just like, it's coming, it's here. Every year I've seen the the sunken, hollowed features of Carlos and Greg and, and all the volunteers who have been literally around the clock. I mean, in Carlos' sake, he has stayed awake for a couple days at a time. Man, I, four days before the Fondo, I, I don't remember. I mean, I, I start to black out. I think I go into autopilot. You know, I mean, everything is just coming at you. And yeah, it's fight or flight. There was some structure to it leading up to that moment in time and that helps you get through it, but it's such a massive event. They're definitely excited and they're feeling, they're, they're feeling that energy, they're running off of the energy of, of the participants, but you can just see how uh, fatigued they are. But it, it's, it's a good thing, you know, I really I love seeing Carlos like that because he, it just, it, it shows how much he cares, it shows how much the, this community cares. I sit in a meeting with this guy about fixing their roads and then they fucking follow us around and tear down our signs for the event. And they're paying somebody to do it and then they want to bill us for it. Tell me that that makes sense. They're saying that the signs are a hazard. This has never happened before. In the last two years, they've had a county guy out there tearing down the signs for the event. From the outsider perspective, it it looks flawless, but from the inside, it's, it can be kind of hectic, and there can be some, some frustrations. Today putting them on reflector signs. And that's what Rex told him was no problem, that he could, and they pointed to it, and they said, we can put them on these reflector signs, right? And he said, yes, that's okay. And then the next day, they were gone. And now I get this email from you guys telling us that they're all coming down again. I mean, it's absurd. I, I don't understand what it is that we're doing wrong because we did exactly what you guys had asked us to. Maybe they sometimes just don't get the memo, but okay. they're not out there um, right. double checking, let's say. When they see something out of order, they tear it down. And that frustrates us because oftentimes the signage, it's a key, obviously it's a key route finding, wayfinding component of the event for thousands of people. It's the first way the event can go wrong. We've got a sign crew that spends like, like a freaking week working on posting signs on the route. 
if we were to staff this entire event, the entry fee would quadruple or quintuple or do something ugly. <laughs> uh, something, something so ugly that I don't think 7,500 people would want to come and do it. Um, the point is, people are compelled to participate in this event and they want to give the most valuable thing they have, which is their time. And it's humbling, it's an honor. Um, we see people driving from Southern California, from Nevada, from Oregon, just to volunteer. Our volunteers are able to keep us going too because they bring this renewed energy back to the team. And when these people show up, it's um, the, the event comes to life. I mean, it's we've done all this planning, we get to event day, and then a whole bunch of angels show up and they do a lot of the heavy lifting to accomplish what we had planned for, but with that human effort that it takes to actually pull it off. Hey, can you talk about wedding times with me? The wedding, do you know about the wedding? When I heard about the wedding, I was excited. You know, that was great. I thought it was, an, it was an awesome twist. It was a great way to celebrate this couple who had actually met at the Grand Fondo to have Levi then be their pastor. I think they threw it up on Facebook, like, hey, we want to get married at, at, at the Fondo. Do you think it's possible for you to actually perform the ceremony? And well, sure enough, it's easy. You go online and you just put your name in a, in, a, in, a, in a field and you hit enter and you're done. You're ready to go. Bonus for Levi. He's now a brother, a brother reverend at the Progressive Universal Life Church, which is an honor he'll carry for the rest of his life. You just sing a little bit. No, she likes, she, um, you know that song, I Will Always Love You? You just have to do like the first verse. The Dolly Parton song, Whitney Houston did it. I was uh, told by Fisher that I had to sing at the wedding which I was a little nervous about because I'm not the greatest singer. And I and that one, yeah. So you have to do that. That would have been ugly. I would have ruined the wedding if I'd had to sing. So luckily I just got to be, you know, like one of the, um, you know, in the wedding party. I was dressed in pink, so it was perfect. For me personally, this is the first time that I got a, uh, a special bike for the Grand Fondo. They haven't, in the past, they don't, they haven't had a history of making like special one-off bikes. But um, I spoke to Brett Graves at, at Specialized and he had been wanting to do a project like this. And he had a concept in mind. And so he, they actually hand painted it at Morgan Hill and uh, match the stem and the seat post, and, and it's, it's spectacular. I mean, it's by far the most beautiful bike I've ever received in my life. So it's pretty cool. It just added to the excitement of the fifth grand final. In Levi's Grand Fondo, the whole deal with this organization of the mass chaos, and that's what I really call it, is that it's really just controlled chaos. What it takes to do something like this, um, I've been doing this for a long time, a lot of different types of events, and it's just amazing um, the sheer number of skills it takes to get through a day. You know, you see it and you're just like, wow, these people are so passionate about this, and you're, you're taken aback because they're passionate about something that you've created, and they want to do everything they can to make it grow and thrive and live and survive and, and be powerful and meaningful for everybody who comes to ride this event. And they're as passionate about it as you are. It's just amazing how every day we're trying to pick up one more skill that might be advantageous in, in actually being able to get this thing and see it through to the end so that uh, all of our riders uh, know that when they're out on the course, um, they don't have to worry about anything because we've all got it taken care of. Anybody who gets to see any portion of this and how these things come together, uh, especially if they get to see it at several points within the, the le weeks leading up to an event, um, get to a glimpse of the things that it takes to do this. And if you've never seen it before, it's, it's baffling. So I'm not a morning person at all. I, it, sometimes it's like, I mean, it, it's, it's like peeling gum off the cement to get, get out of bed, you know? I'm just like, just like that, I don't know why, but 
not on the Grand Fonda morning. It's 5 a.m. and I'm out of bed. I'm ready and excited. Sun's not up yet, but you can just feel that that uh, Santa Rosa is awake already, and they're they're raring to go. All the bikes are tuned. All the clothes are washed. Legs are shaved. Everybody's fueled up and um, drinking coffee and ready to go. So it, it's a lot of excitement. The uh, the on-site production crew right there at the start line, they got one shot to get this right, and people are literally starting to show up. Like you, there's no time to sit around and scratch your chin and think about it. If you hadn't considered it, if you don't have a plan, and whatever your plan was, it changed. It, Something happens. The stage won't go together right. The arch is funny. Um, you know, something will go. Something will go sideways. People are literally riding up, and you've got one shot. It, it, it's great. Once you have like a row of ten people, you can't see through it, so you don't know how many more people there are behind it. You walk up the stairs and you turn around and look, and it just like it's just this. Uh, you can't. It's, it's an image. You see it, but you feel the energy from all of these people because it's this, you don't know how it happened, but there's this ocean of people that goes as far as you can see. I'm not even kidding. I mean, the curvature of the earth, as Dave Toll said, prevents you from seeing the end of this line of people. There's no way to describe it. You know, you'd have to, you'd have to be there to experience it. It's, you know, it's kind of out of body, out of mind. Welcome everybody back to the fifth annual Levi's Grand Fondo. It's, uh, we were working pretty hard this morning, um, but when we started seeing this line accumulate, man, it's like Christmas again. We're so excited to see this. This is a, a year's worth of, of work for the Bike Monkey crew that is, is culminating at this moment. Like you said, there's 7,500 people lined up on the line. Family, friends out there, pros, high school, a lot of high school riders this year were on the starting line. Um, so yeah, it, it is truly an electric, just uh, exhilarating feeling to be on the start line. I, I always tell people that the best part of the Grand Fondo is the start because it's 7,500 people, you know, line, that we're taking over this boulevard. I mean, it's, it's like four lanes wide, right? And you can't see the back. And if you're in the back, you can't see the front. I mean, it's, it's crazy. There are 10,000 of us here right now from five. Four, three, two, one. This, this grin just forms on your face. You can't help it. It's just this the most amazing feeling because it's all come down to this moment. And especially this year, you know, we just, we didn't know what it was gonna be like. We kept thinking about the starting line of the 2013 edition of Levi's Grand Fondo. What's it gonna feel like? Things have changed. We've been through something together. And yet these people are still coming and here they are. And all of that melted away when you saw how excited all of these people were to be here this morning to start this ride with us. It, it changed all of that. It's created by those people who come to the event. They bring that with them. You promised to clean her chain, pump her tires, and fix her flats for as long as you have the power? Absolutely. By the power vested in me by the state of California and as master of ceremonies for Levi's Grand Fondo, I hereby pronounce you husband and wife. to take 
what made him fall in love with Sonoma County and share that with the rest of the world through this event. Has it outgrown him? Yeah, it's outgrown all of us and it'll continue to do that. If one day, 20 years from now, someone lines up, some kid lines up because he can't wait to ride this ride that he feels has, has become part of you know, what cyclists do in the sport, and he has to ask, why do they call it Levi's Grand Fondo? That's a success. <laughs> I think Greg summed up best, every year we're gonna make this event better, even if only by a little bit.